Welcome to problem 14, part D of the Computer Science 121 2013 Winter 2 Practice Final Exam. So we've already previously proven a few properties of adding even and odd numbers, and we're going to use those now in this proof about properties of the Fibonacci numbers. So at the top here, we've got a recursive definition of the Fibonacci numbers. So the nth Fibonacci number, f sub n, is equal to 1 if n is equal to 1. It's equal to 1 also if n is equal to 2, and it's equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2 if n is greater than or equal to 3. And this is a recursive definition because we can see that this structure f sub n, the nth Fibonacci number that we're defining, gets used here and here in the definition. So we've got two recursive appearances, 1 to the n minus 1th Fibonacci number and 1 to the n minus 2nd Fibonacci number. So our job is to prove by induction that every third Fibonacci number, and no others, is even. That is, f sub n is even when n is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. And it says to draw a recursive structure from the definition of the Fibonacci numbers, divide into three cases, and use the facts that we proved above, that two even numbers added together is even, two odd numbers added together is even, and an odd number and an even number added together gives us an odd result. Okay, so the first is a pattern for induction, and fortunately we have one, so I'm just going to follow through this pattern. We need to identify the recursive structure in the problem, which we've already done. We're going to be using the recursive structure of the Fibonacci numbers itself to structure our proof. Then we want to circle each recursive appearance of the structure inside its definition. We've done that too. We want to divide the cases in the recursive definition into those without recursive appearances, the base cases, and those with recursive appearances the recursive or inductive cases. We haven't done that yet, so let's go ahead and do that. We've got recur recursive appearances in this case, which makes it a recursive or inductive case. I'll just mark it as an inductive case, since we're going to be doing an induction proof. And then up here, we've got no recursive appearances, so these are both base cases. We've got base case number one and base case number two. Okay, so we know the recursive structure of the thing that we're trying to work with in our proof, and that should give us the structure of our proof, just in the way that we've seen previously, a predicate logic theorem gives us a structure to use to set up our direct proofs. In this case, this recursive structure gives us a structure we can use to set up our induction proof. So what else do we need? We need a predicate describing what we want to say about the structure, and that's actually given to us. Right here, we've got a predicate that says what we want to say about the structure f of n is even when n is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. In fact, that's not really a theorem at all, uh, although it says that's what we want to prove. Implicitly, what it's saying is that that's true for every legitimate value of n. So in this case, since we start with n equals 1 and we move up from there, it's saying that that's true for all positive integers n. But we can just label this as our predicate, and the parameter here that changes is n. So this is a predicate parameterized by n. Okay, now we've got that piece of the puzzle. Our theorem is going to be for all n in an appropriate domain, and we said that would be the positive integers here. p of n holds. And then we'll complete the proof template. I do double check one thing about our predicate. It's easy to choose something that you think is your predicate, but in fact it's just some arithmetic quantity, a number. Uh, for example, it would not be appropriate for our predicate to be just f of n. f of n is a Fibonacci number. It's something like 3 or 5 or 8, and those aren't true or false values. We want our predicate to be something where we plug in n and we get back a value that's true or false, because in the end we want to say, well, that predicate is true for all the values of n that we're interested in. And a good way to do that is to check to see, is your predicate something that you can phrase as a question, a yes or no question? So here, is our predicate something we could phrase as a yes or no question? Well, it would be something like, is f of n even when n is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise? And sure enough, that's a perfectly legitimate yes or no question. Whereas just, for example, is f of n or is the nth Fibonacci number would not be a legitimate question. So be really careful about that. Double check your predicate and make sure it really is something that's going to give you a true or false value once you plug in n. 
Okay, so we've got our predicate. We can state our theorem, which is that our predicate is true for all positive integer values of n. And now we're ready to move on to our proof template. So I'm going to move to the next slide here, which gives me a proof template. It's pretty busy, so I suggest you spend some time with it if you haven't already. Don't just grab this and try and use it for the very first time on an exam proof of an inductive property. But this stuff at the top here we've effectively already done. We've filled in our predicate. We've filled in our theorem. I'm not going to write proof by structural induction explicitly. We're working on a proof by structural induction, and the problem tells us we should be proving by induction anyway, so I won't worry too much about that. We need a base case for each non-recursive case, and in that base case we're going to prove that the theorem holds in that case, and end by showing our theorem is true for the base case structure. So let's look over here and see if we can construct our two base cases. And I know there's two because there is a non-recursive case here and a non-recursive case here, so I'm going to need a base case for each of them. So base case number one when n is equal to one, because that's what characterizes this base case, uh, I need to prove f sub n is, and do I need to prove that it is even or odd? I could write out the whole thing. It's even when n is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise, but we actually know whether n is divisible by 3 or not, so I'm going to be a bit more specific. n is not divisible by 3, so I want to prove that f sub n is odd, and I'll just write in here, because n equals 1 is not, n, which is equal to 1, is not divisible by 3. Okay. I'll leave some room to finish up that base case later. And meanwhile, what I'd like to do is set up the next base case. Okay. So base case number two. Let's go back up to the recursive structure and figure out what conditions this base case occurs under. So this base case number two happens when n is equal to two. So we want to say when n is equal to two, we want to prove our theorem, our predicate that is, that f of n is even when n, in this case 2, is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. 2 is not divisible by 3, so again we're going to be proving that f sub n is odd. So when n is equal to 2, prove f n is odd because n 2 in this case is not divisible by 3. Okay, and that's our next base case. I've got that set up. I'm not going to prove either of these yet, because what I want to do is just set up the structure of my proof first. So let's move on in the template of a structure for an induction proof. And it says here that I'm going to have one of these inductive steps for each recursive case. Now I actually only have in this particular case, one recursive or inductive case. So I'm going to have one inductive step, and that's pretty common. I'm going to consider an arbitrary recursive structure of the appropriate type, uh, one that will be the shape of my structure in the recursive case. So again, this is just like the base case. I'm just figuring out what characterizes my recursive case. So let's look over here. What does characterize my recursive case? Well, I come to my recursive case when n is greater than or equal to 3. So I am going to consider an arbitrary inductive step. Consider an arbitrary positive integer uh, n greater than or equal to 3. Because that's all I care about in this case. This really is just a proof by cases. I want to prove this theorem true for all positive integers n. I have handled this case when n is equal to 1. I've handled this case when n is equal to 2. Now I need to handle the case where n is greater than or equal to 3. And it's perfectly okay for me to simply assume that n is greater than or equal to 3, because if that's not true, then I'm going to fall into one of my other cases. 
Okay, then I'm going to make my induction hypothesis. And this is really the heart of any induction proof. This is the power that induction gives us, that we get to assume that the theorem holds for each of the recursive appearances of our structure. So we circled the recursive appearances. I want to assume that my theorem holds for f sub n minus 1. And I want to assume that my theorem holds for f sub n minus 2. So I'm going to make those assumptions. And I'll actually have two assumptions as part of my induction hypothesis. And I know that that's true here, because I had two circled recursive appearances in this particular inductive case. So assume, and I'm always going to be assuming p of something. Okay, well, what do I fill p in with in order to get from this n that I'm interested in, the arbitrary n, to these recursive appearances? Well, I'm not going to fill it in with n. I actually can't fill it in with f of n minus 1. In some sense, that's what I'd like, because that's what I care about. But I need a parameter to p that will give me an f of n minus 1. And that's just going to be n minus 1. If I'm looking at p of n minus 1, then when I fill in n minus 1 for n in each of these cases, I'm going to see f of n minus 1 right here. If I fill in n minus 2 in place of n, then I'll see f of n minus 2 here. And I'll end up assuming that my predicate holds for the case that's relevant for my recursive appearances. So I'm going to assume p of n minus 1, and I'm going to assume p of n minus 2. And in theory, you could just stop there, say assume p of n minus 1 and p of n minus 2. But that's not going to help you much later on in the proof. What you really want to know is what does that mean. So I'm really assuming, let's say that is, f of n minus 1 is even when n is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. So f of n minus 1 is even when, and be careful to plug in that n minus 1 for every occurrence of n. So this was fn, and I'm going to change it to fn minus 1. And this was n, I'm going to change it to n minus 1, is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. And f sub n minus 2 is even when this is not the same, n minus 2 is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. So these two assumptions are the same in structure. One of them is for the n minus 1 case. One of them is for the n minus 2 case. And now, my structure tells me I need to show that the theorem holds for a. I need to plug into my predicate something so that my predicate will talk about n. And because I typically choose the same variable that I'm working with in my predicate for the variable I use in my inductive step, then the thing that I'm proving looks just like my original predicate. So what I really need to prove here is p of n. So I need to prove f sub n is even when n is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. OK. Well, how are we going to go about this? We don't even know whether n is divisible by 3 or not. And we need to handle both of those cases, right? There's effectively two cases here in this thing we're trying to prove, that it's divisible by 3. Sorry, that f of n is even when n is divisible by 3. And we need to prove f sub n is odd when n is not divisible by 3. So a reasonable way to go is to prove each of those individually. Let's start with the one that gives us the most information. When n is divisible by 3, then what do we know? So let's make ourselves a bit of room. Ooh, I think I'm going to run out of room on this question. There's the end of the page. So case number one. If n is divisible by 3, then well, what do we know? Um, We'd like to get to our induction hypothesis as soon as possible. That's certainly something we should be thinking about. Uh, we also know since n is divisible by 3, then n is equal to 3 times k for some integer k. So we could re-express n that way. It's not clear that that gets us any closer to f sub n minus 1 or f sub n minus 2. We also know, because we are in this case of the recursive structure right here, 
that f sub n is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. And we should use that, because that's what characterizes this case of a recursive structure. So altogether, those are the things we know. Can we use those to get to our induction hypothesis? And I'd say the answer is yes. We can say, um, let's see, if n is divisible by 3, then not quite sure how to fill this in. But I am going to say, uh, because n is greater than or equal to 3, f sub n is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. Uh, and f sub n minus 1 is even when n minus 1 is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. f sub n minus 2 is even when n minus 2 is divisible by 3 and odd otherwise. We ought to be able to make some kind of use of that. So let's see. f sub n is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. Uh, are n minus 1 and n minus 2 divisible by 3? Well, if n is divisible by 3, n minus 1 can't be divisible by 3, right? It's got to be 1 less than divisible by 3. So if we, if we take that 3k that we said n must be equal to, n minus 1 is 3k minus 1. So that's not going to be divisible by 3. And n minus 2 is also not going to be divisible by 3. We won't get to a number divisible by 3 again until we get to n minus 3. So that's actually something we know up here. n minus 1 and n minus 2 are not divisible by 3. OK, so by the induction hypothesis, f sub n minus 1 and f sub n minus 2 are, let's see, are they odd or even? Uh, when n is not divisible by 3, they are odd. So they are both odd. And here's where those proofs that we did up above uh, come in handy. We already proved that the sum of two odd integers is even. So uh, f sub n, the sum of two odd, whoops, odd integers is even. Great, so that finishes our case number one. We were supposed to be proving that f sub n was even because n is divisible by 3. OK, well, that's one case. Now, the hint up above said to divide into three cases. I would naturally sort of divide into two cases, one where n is divisible by 3 and one where it's not. But I can definitely imagine dividing into three, uh, one where it's divisible by 3, one where it's not, and it's maybe one too large to be divisible by 3, one where it's not divisible by 3, and it's two too large to divis be divisible by 3. So one where the remainder when divided by 3 is 1, one where the remainder when divided by 3 is 2. Uh, and those are going to be a little bit different. And crucially, if we know the remainder when n is divided by 3 is 1, then we know f sub n minus 1 uh, is going to be even, because n minus 1 is going to be divisible by 3. And we know if the remainder when n is divided by 3 is 2, then we know f sub n minus 2 will be even, because n minus 2 will be divisible by 3. So I'm going to go ahead and write out those cases. Case number two, if the remainder when n is divided by 3 is 1, then n is not divisible by 3 n minus 1 is divisible by 3, and n minus 2 is not divisible by 3. So by the induction hypothesis, f sub n minus 1 is even because n minus 1 is divisible by 3, and f sub n minus 2 is odd, because n is greater than or equal to 3, f sub n is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus 
f sub n minus 2. That's just the same as we did before. But in this case, we're adding an even and an odd, which is the sum of an even and odd number, integer. So f sub n is odd. And that's just as we required, because n is not divisible by 3. And that leaves us with one last case, case 3. In case 3, if the remainder when n is divided by 3 is 2, then n is not divisible by 3, nor is n minus 1, but n minus 2 is divisible by 3. So as in case number 2, f sub n is the sum of odd and even numbers and is odd. And that takes care of our whole inductive case. All we have to do is go back and fill in the holes that we left for the base cases, and we should be all set. And in fact, this inductive case actually gives some insight as to why it is that every third Fibonacci number is even. It's because we start out with two odd numbers for the Fibonacci numbers. Well, when we add those together, we're getting an even number. So the third one will be even. And then the next two are going to be odd, because first we're going to add an odd and an even to get an odd. And then we're going to move sort of one step forward. It's like we've got a window sliding across these numbers. And we'll add an even with the odd that we just created. And we'll get another odd. And then finally, the window slides off of that even number. And we get two odd numbers again. And that gives us an even. And the induction proof structure turns that insight into a formal piece of machinery that we can use to prove this is always true. So let's just fill in the base cases. And the base cases shouldn't be hard. In fact, usually I'd have done them first, but I just got kind of caught up in the inductive step once we had it phrased. So let's just finish up the base case then. When n equals 1, prove f of n is odd. Well, f of n in this case is f of 1, which is 1, which is odd, just as we require. And where did I get that from? That's just from the definition up here. We knew this was a case where f of n was equal to 1. And we know that the next one is a case where f of n is equal to 1. So f of n is equal to f of 2, which is 1, which is odd. And that takes care of our proof. So go back over this proof and think about how it was that I pulled all of the recursive structure just from this definition of the Fibonacci numbers. And that gave me the vast majority of the proof. What wasn't there just from the recursive structure, I mostly got just by carefully stating everything that I knew and everything that I needed to prove. And then the last little bit was recognizing down here that dividing up into cases would be useful. And to a certain extent, that was just looking at the structure of the thing that I was going to prove. I was going to prove an AND. And so I proved each part of the AND. Now dividing into three cases I did because I kind of knew that remainders when divided by three would be important. But you could have done it dividing into just two cases. And then from there, all that was really left was to recognize that we were adding these even on odd numbers and have those theorems available that we just proved for A, B, and C.